Hey everybody, I'm Ben Yee, Secretary for the Manhattan Democratic Party and uh, Democratic State Committeeman for the 66th Assembly District in New York City. I'm Alyssa Stein. I am a County Committee member in AD 66 Part A, and I'm Secretary of that part as well. And we're here on this really beautiful November Gorgeous. night. Stunning. Is it November? Shit, global it's warming. November. I know. It was Halloween a couple of nights ago. <laughs> yes. Although it was pretty crappy out a couple of days ago, so... All right, what are we talking about today? Tonight we are talking about... Actually, we were planning to talk about how local parties are run, mm -hmm. how the local Democratic Party is run, how the leadership works and right, all that. Sure. And then there was this bomb today about Donna Brazil and talking about the National Party. Yeah. Um, and since they are run in similar fashion. Similarly. Yeah, a similar basic structure yeah. I learned from your workshop. I thought we would start with county committee. Yes. And those specifics, do that quickly, and then kind of talk about what was going on in national politics. Sure. How's and if sound? we uh, can't get through all of, if county committee takes too much time, we can do multiple parts. We'll do county, state, national. A three-parter. Maybe. We'll see how long this we'll takes. We'll see, but we're going to well, do let's this let's start. Fast. We're okay. at one minute. Let's go. Let's see what's okay. going on. So county committee. Yes. There are individual county committees for every assembly district. There are divisions of the whole county committee for every assembly district. Okay. And there's county committee members that represent uh, election districts, and they're meant to caucus, essentially, with the other folks in their division, which is the assembly district. Okay, great. So we got that down. Then there are the district leaders. Yes. Each district, each district has two district leaders, a male and a female. Correct. And they're elected, and they kind of, they form the executive board. Right. That meets supposedly once a month. Yes. Although I heard that the October meeting did not happen. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that's Largely story. once a month, whatever, but... Right, generally right. once a month. That's, yeah. And then the person who oversees that... Yes. ...is the county leader. Right. Keith Wright, lots of controversy about him right now. Mm -hmm. Lobbyists, or maybe not lobbyists, but his firm is lobbyists, whatever. How does he get that job? Right. So, the district leaders, there's two per an assembly district part in Manhattan. Right. And they're elected by voters. I have a question. Yes. What's the part thing? Like, ah, I'm in part A, yes. why are there parts? Right, so this is actually, uh, they don't have parts in the Bronx, they don't have parts in Brooklyn. I'm pretty sure they have parts in uh, Queens, and maybe in Staten Island, I'm not sure about that. And okay. we certainly have them in Manhattan. They're just um, sort of arbitrary divisions that the party creates to, I guess you'd say, expand representation on the executive board. So in Brooklyn, it's two district leaders per an assembly district. In Manhattan, we have two per assembly district part, and the parts are only there because the Democratic Party of Manhattan wants it that way. We could oh. abolish all of them, um, and just but we don't. Thing. So instead right. of calling it like 66 and 67, it's 66 part A and B. Correct. It's just a way of delineating. Well, no, because 66 and 67 are different assembly districts, no, right. and I mean, that's set in law. Got it. Okay. Okay. But we wanted more divisions, either to be more local or to create more local representation. It doesn't necessarily... It's not necessarily based on population. Right. It's just that somebody decided to do it this way. Right. There's a document called the party call that every level of the Democratic Party puts out, which apportions votes to areas, to particular divisions. And the divisions are spelled out in the party call. For example, how many county committee members you get per an election district, that's in the party call. How many district leaders you get, that's in the party call. What areas the district leaders cover, that's in the party call. Okay, so that's all official shit. That is correct, but that's decided internally to the party. Got it. Okay, so, thank you. Now we're back to how does the county leader get selected? The district leaders are elected. Yes. How does the county leader get his job? Right. So, the district leaders all meet. Well, in theory, they all show up, but, you know, whatever. In theory, there's a meeting of the district leaders, which is the executive board, and they vote from amongst themselves which one of them shall be the county leader. Oh, so it's a district leader who is then chosen to be the Correct. county leader. If a, first of all, I had no idea. Second of all, the district leader who is now the county leader, mm -hmm. does he also fulfill the job of district leader or is a new person he spotted does. in? He does, no. Okay. He is also a district leader. He's also a district leader. So, he can keep the job for the term that he is the district leader. Correct. Right, so after two years, if the guy is voted out, if someone were no longer to be a district leader, they could no longer be county right. leader either. Are there any term limits for a district leader? There are no term leader. limits. No. Nope. So you could be county leader for 30 years if you wanted to. I'm pretty sure that's happened. That was a hypothetical. Yeah, but, well, it's you know, New York. It's New York. All right, politics. Okay, so now we understand that. So 
the general population does not elect, elect the county leader. Right. It is the district leaders who select the county leader, and then he's voted in. There's a vote of the district leaders. Do they do that crazy shouting vote, or is it a show of hands vote? There are far fewer district leaders, and it's usually okay. not contested. It's usually decided beforehand. There's an agreement, a consensus beforehand, an as agreement? to who will have the votes. Not okay. an agreement, but... So is there like back table, Absolutely. wheeling and dealing about uh, who gets to be county leader? Depends what you consider wheeling and dealing. But people... Uh, like trading favors. I'll let you have a fairway in your neighborhood if you elect me. <laughs> County uh, leader. The county leader doesn't have that kind of power, okay. but there's definitely uh, there are definitely positions which are which are traded. Who will make up the county leadership? Uh, the county leader often runs their own slate for uh, leadership of the county committee, and these are all titular for the most part. But right. people like to have titles, like to feel like big shots. I gotta say, the power in this stuff is pretty outstanding. You know, people want to be in charge of something. They really do. Even at a very small level, it's pretty amazing at how important a title can be. It's also really valuable for when you want to try and get things done. So as secretary, I get to say I'm secretary. That gives me some clout. And that, so like when I go and educate people, I do these videos, I go teach Real Politics 101. People believe me because right. I'm secretary of this thing and I'm a state committeeman. And, you know, that right, for right. me has been beneficial and I try to use that power responsibly to educate and help others. In no way am I dissing, hey, I'm the elected secretary too, I get to maintain the email list. Hey, I'm right, the only person that. who can reach out, but that's an important thing. Don't abuse it. <laughs> but for my county committee, which you are a part of, yes. um, we are working hard You have to... my email address? Shh. I don't share it with anybody. Thanks. It's completely privacy Ben protected. at BenjaminYee.com. Send me questions. Uh, but, it's an, but it's an important function. I am the sole person who communicates to our group, and we're really working on some activism yeah. in county committee that I'm That's hoping good. other people in county committees across the city will start doing too, uh, about taking what's going on right now, which has been potentially transformative. Now, what's this you're talking about? This is, I'm talking about the second meeting that's going to happen. We're not talking about that today. Rules committee. Or but, rules meeting, yeah. Right, okay. but just as a secretary of a county committee, there's an opportunity to engage, to educate, to communicate. And in theory, that's what the county committee is there to do, to engage right. local voters in the governance of the political parties. Because if you only have two parties, and there's a reason for that, and that's, that's another Real workshop. Politics 101 workshop, you can tune in for one of those. When you have only two parties, or in a place like New York City, really only one party, participation in the party is really important because that's how the Democratic Party, in this case, learns what voters care about and how voters exercise control over one of the main political institutions in the country. And okay. the Republican Party works the same way, mind you. So a quick moment yes. for a public service announcement. Uh -huh. Tuesday, vote. Oh yeah, don't, Tuesday, vote. don't forget that. Yeah, that's really important. Really important elections. Slightly less important than the primaries. Yes, but, but constitutional but convention. Constitutional convention, which we talked about in a two-parter. Yes. So go to the You Matter YouTube channel. Yes. And you can watch those. We'll put a link, or if you're watching this, obviously you're there. And don't forget, for the constitutional convention question, which is prop one on the ballot, after you're done voting for mayor, uh, public advocate, all those, the city council members, flip the ballot over to vote, right? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's going to be on the back. Okay. It should be obvious, but yeah, if it's not... I miss uh, the lever voting. I find this paper voting more complicated than it should be, but that's another conversation. No arguments another there. Yeah. It's, not, it's not as satisfying. All right. I know, I love that. And the curtain opened. Anyway, we got closed. one minute left. One minute left. So. Okay, so today, Donna Brazil came out with. Uh, oh, are we done with the county leadership thing? I think so. Okay, good. Or rather, okay, yes, let's go. Yeah, let's I mean, do we this. Can always revisit. But Donna Brazil came out, article saying that yes, Hillary Clinton's machine ran the DNC, that yes, they threw everything to her, that Bernie Sanders was burned, that she felt terrible about it. I thought it was a remarkable mea culpa, mm. like taking no responsibility whatsoever. That was my that was my feeling from this article, but can you break that down for people? What exactly seemed to have happened? Sure. And what does that mean? Like, what does that mean going forward? Right. I wrote about this briefly on the internet, but I'm going to rehash it quickly, probably in about 20 seconds or so, and we can go deep into how the DNC actually works and how that leadership structure operates at a later point. Okay. But what's important to know is that 
The members of the DNC are selected by the state committees of the 50 states, for the most part. There are 100 appointees of the chair, but for the most part, all these people come through the state parties. Now, amongst themselves, they elect the chair of the DNC. However, when your party controls the presidency, the president is the nominal and de facto head of the party. So all of this really, in theory, rested Barack Obama's oh, feet. Oh, so that, that's why she was, she was dissing Barack. Correct. Like he did a terrible job while he was, I don't know, busy being president. Now, that is one way to look at this, and I'm going to try to do the rest of this in 30 seconds. You know what? But, take three minutes. Okay, we'll take a few minutes to do this. It's, yeah. it's take current events. Breath. and It's important. But here's how it works. Here's, here's sort of how it bad. goes down. The president is nominally in charge of the party. However, even if you're a sitting president, you're not the king of your political party because there are other factions. Now, there are a lot of reasons why Debbie Wasserman Schultz could have, or we know now that she was not a very enthusiastic um, chair of the DNC. There are a lot of reasons why that might have been the case. I posited three big potentials. The first is, the first chair of the DNC after Barack Obama was elected was actually Tim Kaine. In 2009 to 2011, Tim Kaine was chair of the DNC. I did not, I didn't know that. And Tim Kaine was actually the first, or one of the first statewide elected officials to endorse Barack Obama in the primary. He was an Obama supporter from early on. He was the first chair, and he actually did a good job fundraising. He outraged the RNC uh, in between 2009 and 2011, even though the Democratic Party was beaten terribly in the 2010 midterms. So he was pretty active and was actively fundraising, and he did a pretty good job of that. Okay, quick question. Yes. Can you be an elected official in any way and be the head of the DNC at the Absolutely. same time? Absolutely. You okay. can. Okay. You can. So you and that's a jobs. whole other debate about whether or not we should be doing that, and or we can talk about that interest, when okay. we talk about um, we can talk about the merits of that and detractions when we talk about DNC leadership maybe okay. next time. But to uh, press on just a little bit. After Tim Kaine left, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was selected as the DNC chair, and she was actually the co-chair of Hillary Clinton's primary campaign against Barack Obama. So technically, this is now a Clinton loyalist who comes in to okay. run the DNC. Now, there's a couple of reasons why it might have happened in that way. First, Barack Obama might have felt compelled to try and unify the party by putting somebody from the other side, I guess you'd say, like the old school people right. in charge of the DNC, but then just tried to sideline her by ignoring the DNC entirely. This is, you know, it's plausible, of course, but I think it's sort of, it doesn't really jive with the fact that he wanted to have an active DNC before with Tim Kaine. Another possibility is um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was just not personally invested in the idea of being chair and took it because they needed somebody and uh, she just wasn't very active as a result and was more concerned with being, I guess she was congresswoman at the time. Um, this is possible too, but then you have to ask, well, if that's the case and Barack Obama wanted an active DNC, why didn't he replace her? It could be that they were both apathetic about the whole situation, but again, that also doesn't really jive with like the Tim Kaine pick. Right. The last, or one of the, the third large bucket, is that Barack Obama felt like he needed to give something to the old school folks, and the compromise was old school gets the DNC, so we put a Hillary supporter in charge of that, and Barack Obama gets the White House and OFA. Now, OFA, which was Obama's incredible field and digital OFA operation, is... oh, oh, it was Obama for America, and then became organizing for America after the election. That never got fully integrated with the DNC. The list ah, never got fully integrated. Ah, interesting. And it became its own thing. So perhaps it ended up being that they decided to just split it. Barack Obama gets a piece, the establishment gets a piece, and really the DNC is an establishment institution. Right, so in all of this, at that point with Debbie Washington and Schultz, it's like the establishment. Right. Okay. And whether or not you, whether or not you think that's the rationale for why it happened, the DNC ended up basically reverting to control by folks who had been there before. Right. And they could make a reasonable argument in theory that the DNC is the party, it is an establishment vehicle, so the people who have been there the longest know best how to run it. It turns out they didn't do a very good job running it. Oh, it sounds like it was terrible. 
but that's one argument that might have been okay. posited. Now, I wasn't nearly as inside the party then as I am now, so I don't know which one of these things is really the case. I do remember being on the Obama campaign in the fundraising office um, when Obama won and the effort that was made to try and incorporate the Hillary supporters into what was done the Obama campaign, like how difficult and painful that was because people needed to be moved high up into the ranks because they had been big donors, they had been very active in, in the other that's a very hard thing, campaign. That's a very hard thing to pull off. And the same thing was happening now with Hillary taking leadership and she won the nomination however she got there. Yes. And then trying to get all those Bernie supporters involved and enthusiastic and included. Right. And it, you know, it didn't go well. So we're going to stop this now because we're at 15 minutes. But that was sort of a recap of how the dynamics of the DNC could have played out. I think next time we can go more in depth into how the DNC actually works and why it operates the way it does and how that impacted the way it was managed during Washerman Schultz's term or Donna Brazile's term. Okay, awesome. See you we'll later. Back, like probably in five minutes. <laughs>